Hello and welcome to a two-part lecture on World War II. Uh, this is History 1302. It, the great conflict known as World War II in our history uh, is certainly one of the greatest events in the history of man. Uh, at its height, it's going to compel uh, millions of men to go to combat in arms. It will displace and kill millions of civilians, and in general, it will kill millions of people. Uh, it dwarfs uh, what was uh, thought uh, previously the thought the war to end all wars. The First World War killed uh, approximately 10 to 15 million individuals. This war uh, killed somewhere in the 40 to 50 million person range, uh, maybe a few more. Uh, but all that to say is, is that World War II is, uh, for many people and for many nations and for the many continents, uh, certainly Europe, uh, Asia, <coughs> and North America, uh, it is a defining moment in the history of the 20th century. Uh, it is uh, spawned uh, by the First World War in many respects. Uh, you look at the uh, reasons for Germany to become belligerent. Uh, you see the reasons for Germany to uh, st uh, strike out for the war uh, and go uh, for war uh, can be uh, traced back to its treatment uh, and its uh, handling, uh, its handling, Germany's handling of World War I. Uh, in the Nazi uh, reasonings, uh, the Nazi uh, reasons for being uh, the National Socialists, as they're also called, really more properly called, but everybody called them Nazis anyway, so it's an interchangeable term. Uh, the, the Nazi party said, uh, amongst many other things, that the reason that they needed to take power, the needed, that they needed to be voted into power in the 1930s, uh, was is that they would uh, basically bring Germany back and bring, make Germans proud to be German again. And that what had happened in 1918 was a stab in the back. Dolstoisch uh, Legenda is the way it's pronounced poorly by me, of course, in German. Dolstoisch uh, Legenda is essentially the stab in the back. What the Nazis hoped to return to was the spirit of 14, 1914, when people joyously marched off to war, and they hoped to uh, eradicate the and learn from the failures of 1918, which for many Germans, and especially the National Socialists, was the uh, kind of a, a moment for which they never quite psychologically recovered. Uh, but the idea of the stab in the back, uh, the resurrection of Germany, uh, Germans proud to be Germans. And then you go further with Nazi ideology with the idea of late Lebensform, which is essentially living space, the idea that there needs to be a greater Germany that expands eastward uh, into Poland and into the Ukraine, into the Soviet Union or Russia, if you prefer. Uh, all that's there. Uh, that's part of the Nazi ideology uh, that there needed to be this Ubermensch and this, uh, this super race that needed the space to spread out, have many children, and so on. And that actually, I don't know if I mentioned this in the lecture, one of the things that the, uh, the Germans, uh, the Nazis particularly, were very worried about was a declining birth rate in Germany. Uh, you'll see uh, a concerted effort by the Nazi party during the 1930s, uh, the ruling Nazi party, Hitler uh, and on down from there. Uh, they want German women to be very, very uh, fertile, uh, to have children. Uh, and on top of that, if a woman she had, was uh, willing to have or had ten children, if I remember the number, correctly, I believe it was 10, that Hitler himself, the Führer, the leader, would be the godfather to that, those, that child or those children. And so uh, there were special awards and so forth, but this idea of a growing Germany, a spreading Germany, a proud Germany, uh, all was uh, playing into the mindset, into the hopes of the Nazi party, uh, and it is uh, partially a historical uh, remnant of the First World War where Germany felt like it would, had not been defeated, uh, it had, and uh, many German uh, uh, political parties, not just the National Socialists, but you'll see like the Steel Helmets, uh, talk about how Germany had never been invaded and how Germany had not been defeated, uh, which was not frank it was frankly not true. Uh, but at the same time, it, as I may have joked about in class, never let the facts get in the way of a good story uh, as a historian. And that's also true. There's some application to that in politics or in governance. Uh, if you have a narrative to tell and if you believe it sincerely, even though it may be a, a lie or a myth, uh, which are not exactly the same things, or frankly aren't the same things, uh, you can uh, you can promote it pretty well. Uh, Germany, of course, uh, was in the throes of the economic depressions, the 20s and the, uh, especially the early 1930s. Uh, Germany was also uh, uh, worried, very many Germans were worried in the early 1930s uh, when the Nazis come to power uh, about communism. 
uh, you will find a good number of uh, Germans who otherwise thought Hitler and the uh, not the Nazis with the brown shirts, uh, which is the SA, the uh, Sturm Abteilung, uh, led by Ernst Röhm. Basically, they a lot of Germans who may never have been card carrying Nazis, at least not in the early days, uh, they were willing to uh, make bed and get into bed with the Nazis to check the communists. And as I've, I've indicated before to you, the communists could be awfully bloodthirsty as well. Uh, the Nazis are in the 1930s are not going to have a corner on the market of bloodthirstiness and murder and uh, wrecking and up uh, and mayhem. Uh, and so, uh, but Germany is arming in the 1930s. Uh, it is fair to say, and I'm going to skip uh, through this very quickly, uh, you can find plenty of lectures online or in documentaries and so on uh, that would that basically say what I'm about to say, and that is that had the Western Allies uh, made an effort in the 1930s to check Hitler and to check German rearmament, uh, to stop the Reichswehr, as it was initially known as, uh, from becoming the Wehrmacht uh, again, uh, and more particularly becoming a, a real menace and threat to the peace of Europe uh, in the early, 19, the early to mid-1930s, Germany could have been checked uh, had the uh, French or the British or even the Soviets to some degree been willing to lift more of a finger uh, to stop them. But they didn't, especially the French and, and the uh, British. Uh, there was a, a real abdication of uh, leadership, a real ab abdication of power, uh, and Hitler and his boys uh, will fill it. You'll have a series of events in the early to mid-1930s, especially the mid-30s, uh, where Germany uh, slow, and, and this is Hitler doing it now, he's going to be ordering it. He is the supreme leader, he is the unquestioned leader of the party, where the party runs the state, and so there you go. And, and uh, uh, the, the thing is, is that, by the way, nobody, so understand this about how, uh, how tight Hitler was uh, worshipped by the party, almost in a uh, uh, religious sort of way, is, is that nobody Body except for some of the oldest of old, and they were largely gone, but only the oldest of old party members referred to Hitler in the uh, uh, the familiar. Uh, in German, as I understand the language, German has a familiar and a formal. Nobody called Hitler uh, in private. Nobody talked to him in private uh, as uh, as an equal. They always uh, referred to him as an honorific formal uh, sort of thing. <coughs> and so, uh, anyways, all that to say is is that uh, Hitler is calling the shots, uh, and uh, he's uh, the the image you may have of Hitler in the war is a image uh, that is uh, of nineteen late thirties and nineteen forties vintage. Uh, but in the mid nineteen thirties, Hitler was uh, perhaps not as monomaniacal. I'm not saying he's not evil. I'm not saying he is a good man or anything of the sort. Uh, but at the same time, in the mid-1930s, you see a certain caution within Hitler uh, that you do not see as you get toward the end of the 1930s and in the end of the 1940s in the war. And that caution would be like in 1936, when the German army crosses and into and remilitarizes the Rhineland. Uh, the Rhineland was a piece of uh, land, a strip of land, kind of like a demilitarized zone uh, between France and Germany, a leftover remnant of the First World War. Uh, it was designed to be a buffer uh, that was supposed to be uh, controlled and uh, uh, basically uh, manned by the French on the the west bank of the Rhine River, uh, and uh, the Germans were not supposed to cross that, uh, not in any military force. Uh, in fact, as you may know, uh, the Germans were, because of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, uh, the Germans uh, weren't just accused of uh, causing the war, which they uh, in some respects did in the First World War. Uh, they were also made by the Treaty of Versailles to have an army of less than 100,000 men and a very tiny navy. Uh, but part of the rearmament of Germany, the growing of the army, the conscription of the army, which the Western powers especially did little or nothing to check, uh, included uh, little adventures. And that adventure into the Rhineland, where you will see uh, some pictures of German soldiers not riding on tanks, but riding on bicycles. Uh, the, the rearmament was in its infancy, frankly, in 1936. What you find is, is that uh, in secret uh, cables and secret memoranda, uh, between Hitler and his underlings in the um, 
and the Reichstag and the party and the in the uh, and the in the uh, the chancellor he was his, he was really the chancellor of Germany at that point and kind of hadn't quite got to the level that it goes, but basically Hitler's comment to his generals was if the French show any resistance, if the French lift any fingers to stop us, you turn the you turn tail and run, because we are not ready to get into any sort of shootout with the uh, with the French, uh, and but the French did nothing. And uh, so the occupation of the Rhineland, the occupation of the Sudetenland, which is in Czechoslovakia, later Czechoslovakia, again taking Austria, Hungary, uh, and various Austria, excuse me, uh, the assumption uh, of the or the absorption of Austria, all these events plus more, uh, plus the swearing uh, and a personal loyalty oath to Hitler himself. All this creates this storm that is uh, starting to gather up in the mid to late 1930s that's going to help bring the war on. And you may say, uh, what was it, uh, was it uh, that made the, uh, uh, Hitler do this? And Hitler was, uh, he was a warmonger uh, for a man who himself had been in the trenches, a man who himself had been gassed, uh, not horribly so, but he had seen combat. He, he had been awarded the Iron Cross First Class. Uh, and uh, he'd seen combat, but he was a believer that war was a purifying and a good thing for the German people, uh, and it would help uh, strengthen the German soul and German man. And so he looked forward and longed for war, and frankly, Hitler at times wanted war before it came. Uh, if you look in the 1930s, you see uh, these words and you see these uh, recordings by diplomats who meet with Hitler, or you hear some of the folks uh, say uh, um, <coughs> Joseph Goebbels, uh, who kept a very uh, good and detailed diary of his uh, discussions with Hitler. Uh, Joseph Goebbels was the propaganda minister, and he was uh, in the inner circle. Uh, he was an old party hack, though he was uh, Dr. Goebbels, uh, kind of an honorific title, as I recall. Uh, Goebbels was a wicked man, like most of those guys were, meaning meaning most Ger uh, most of the upper echelon Germans. Uh, you got to be, you have to have some level of depravity to get into bed with Nazism, just to be blunt about it. Uh, but anyways, Goebbels was bad. He was a he was a full on liar, amongst other things. Uh, but anyways, uh, if I want to say this about Goebbels, you want to get an idea about the man. I think, at least in a camera sort of way, in a movie sort of way, to get an understanding about the level of depravity and wickedness and those. Those are, and I mean them as moral terms, about Joseph Goebbels, I would invite you to watch the movie uh, Der, uh, Der Untergang, or The Downfall. It came out about 15 years ago. Uh, it's one of the best movies I've ever seen. It is in uh, German, but it's subtitled in English. Uh, uh, if you've come across it, in all likelihood, you probably watched it because of a, the, the, the memes or the uh, dubbing over or the, uh, the changing of the closed captioning because it's in German, and it, you probably saw it with Hitler in the bunker, and, and, and that's Bruno Gans, the actor playing that role. And you have um, various ones that are done. I've seen uh, lots of them over the years, but it's a great movie. But in that movie, it's uh, some students uh, who have seen that I used to assign it as perhaps an extra credit project, but in some over the years, students who uh, uh, watched that movie would say again and again uh, the thing that they couldn't believe, amongst others, was is that. Uh, and then maybe the coldest and the most poignant part of how committed a Nazi and how committed a worldview, like a, a full-on religion, Nazism was. Uh, Soviet communism, the same sort of way. Uh, but anyways, uh, how committed Nazis were was the scene toward the end of the movie where Magda Goebbels, uh, the uh, estranged at times, certainly disaffected, uh, in her own right, cold as ice, uh, wife of Joseph Goebbels. Goebbels cheated on her all day long. It's a, it's a very bad relationship. Anyways, uh, Magda Goebbels uh, will go and kill her children. They had something like five or six, maybe eight children together. I don't remember the exact number anymore. But she will go and kill their children. She gives them all sleeping potions, deep sleeping potions, uh, where the kids, uh, they did not want to drink the, this uh, really acidic, nasty tasting uh, sleeping uh, potion uh, whipped up by a doctor, but they drink it. They have to. Uh, and then she, after they're all good and uh, fast, uh, essentially knocked out, uh, unconscious for all intents and purposes, she one by one takes a uh, it takes uh, cyanide capsules, puts them in the back of their mouth, and force, the mother herself forcibly crushes with a jaw the ch her children the capsules of uh, cyanide, killing the kids. And uh, she does that to all of them. 
And then later that day, uh, this is at the very end of World War II, and as I'm recording it, it is the 2nd of May. Uh, it's about this time period, uh, literally 75 years ago, uh, that uh, I wouldn't say it's exactly right this moment, but what's within about a 24-hour window. Uh, Magda Goebbels, her husband Joseph, uh, they stand out uh, inside the Fuhrer bunker as everything is collapsing around uh, the Nazis. And Joseph Goebbels shoots his wife, uh, kills her dead, and then he turns the gun on himself and kills himself. And they asked why uh, she would do such a thing, why she would kill her children, why she would she go to the, the extremes that she did. She said, and she was like a lot of other uh, committed Nazis, uh, and her husband's the same way, she said, I cannot conceive of a life in Germany without National Socialism. And so when we talk about Goebbels, he's a very wicked man. He's got a uh, depraved and evil family. Uh, the kids, uh, I leave blameless uh, as far as that's concerned, but the parents, completely wicked. But by the way, I will say this very quickly, uh, before, and I probably won't come back to it later uh, in, the, in the second lecture, uh, but in Germany in 1945, as the, the thing is collapsing around the heads of the German leadership, uh, Hitler, of course, himself will commit suicide in the Fuhrer bunker. Uh, Many, many German leaders, uh, military leaders, scientist leaders, uh, political leaders, uh, some will try to flee, some make it to Argentina or elsewhere famously, uh, but many, many, many Germans, and I think it's several thousand in fact, uh, will commit suicide. Maybe it's more than several thousand, maybe close to ten, but many, uh, many German elites will commit suicide in the aftermath uh, or as the, uh, the war draws to a new close. Uh, as one said, uh, I can't believe it's 1918 all over again, and he killed himself right after making that statement. All this to say is, is there is a fanaticism, a zealotry that you find in the most committed of cults, uh, whether they're explicitly religious or they are quasi-religious, atheistic in this case because the Nazis are atheists. Uh, they don't believe in God uh, or anything like that. Uh, but you see this sort of uh, death cult mentality uh, in Nazi circles all over the place. So anyways, uh, the Germans are committed, and Hitler himself was committed to war as a means of politics, a means of expanding uh, greater Germany, Germans to be proud of uh, Germany once more. And in fact, actually, uh, as we uh, proceed toward the outset of World War II in September of 1939, what you tend to find when looking at it from the German perspective, especially Hitler's perspective, is, is that he kept uh, wanting to, in fact, uh, he's trying in some respects to provoke war in 1938, but the, the Westerners won't take the bait. Uh, famously, in 1939, uh, Hitler is going to go to uh, Munich, uh, and I say this, 1939, it was maybe 38, I always get the numbers backed up a little bit in my mind. But anyways, Hitler famously goes to Munich, meets with the Prime Minister of Great Britain, a guy named Neville Chamberlain. Uh, and uh, he, he, Hitler, later commenting about meeting the British, meeting the French, dealing with them, uh, he, com he famously comments, uh, Hitler does, he says, I have uh, met my enemies, or I've met our enemies, and, I've, uh, and I come to know them as tiny little worms. Uh, when you say Munich, that means appeasement in Western languages, whether it's English or French or something else. Uh, famously and, frankly, infamously, infamously has a very negative and dark overtone. Uh, infamously, what you get by appeasing dictators and uh, tyrants, uh, the lesson was learned in the pre-war dur and during the war, is you appease the dictator, he's going to ask for a little more. Um, and he's going to ask for perhaps a lot more. And uh, you don't ask for appeasement. Uh, you don't uh, beg for appeasement while you, as you have your head in the lion's mouth, as it were. Anyhow, uh, you may be thinking to yourself, why on earth were the uh, Western allies, uh, the Soviets I can get to in a second, but why were the Western allies, especially the French and the British, so loath to uh, uh, try to resist the Germans in the coming of World War II and the, to prevent a Second World War? Uh, most uh, Britons, uh, most Frenchmen, uh, did not uh, seek war. The, the, the First World War had a terrible hollowing effect upon the psyche and the physical vitality of both of those nations. Uh, 
a few years ago in 2018, uh, the uh, uh, coming 100th anniversary, the centennial anniversary of the Great War, World War I, was being celebrated and remembered in various ways. For Poland, uh, which was a nation that appeared from time to time on the European continent or on the map, uh, had been for essentially 100 years a divided land between Germany or Greater Germany, uh, meaning the, uh, the Second Reich or Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany, when Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany collapses in 1918 at the end of the First World War, Poland is reborn. So for them, November 11th, 1918 was a moment of, uh, of exultation, the birth of a nation, as it were. It's kind of akin, in a sense, not, November 11th, 1918 would be the, uh, it's like saying July 4th to us. It's not completely 100% analogous, but it's very uh, good enough for our understanding. But across uh, the continent, back in Europe now, making this uh, why, understanding of why the, Ger the English and the French were uh, un, un interested in trying to check the Germans in the 1930s is is that World War One in uh, is remembered in England not as a grand triumph uh, it was in Poland as I just said but grand triumph does not apply in England in 19 in 2018 when England uh, remembered uh, the end of the f end of the First World War or the Great War uh, there were poppies everywhere. Uh, there were uh, red flowers. There were memorials. There were tears. Because what you seemingly lost was an entire generation to seemingly in endless and senseless slaughter. Uh, you see this in the poetry of the First World War. The First World War was uh, big in poetry. You see this in movies uh, that have been made in the last decade or so about the First World War by British uh, uh, filmmakers. There's no triumphalism even though you won the war. And so Britain coming out of the First World War did win it, but it felt like it was perhaps what you might call in your notes a Pyrrhic victory, P-Y-R-R-H-I-C. You, yes, you won, and a Pyrrhic victory strictly said is a battle you win and it costs you the war. Uh, but it could be also, you might press, uh, ex uh, stretch the analogy a little bit, you might uh, stretch it a little bit, uh, almost too far perhaps, but you might say it is a pure victory in war against the Germans. You won the war, but you lost your soul. You won the war, but you lost your vitality. You won the war, but uh, a large chunk of a youth, the, the generation of the youth, 30%, 40%, I'd have to check numbers, but many of your boys who should be the flower, the flowering of the next generation, they're now buried in Flanders Field, as a, a famous poem goes. Uh, or say the very famous, it's associated with the war, though it predates it, is Danny Boy. Uh, that's a great, beautiful song sung by many people, but Danny Boy uh, kind of gets that melancholy, uh, really... Uh, you know, kind of depressed feel about it in the sense that uh, we lost so much by the war. It saw that in France, too. France uh, lost, our, uh, many, uh, frankly, lost more boys than did uh, the British, uh, and France was at the stage of collapse when the United States enters the First World War in, world, uh, in 1917, 1918 particularly. All this is to say is, is that it has uh, per repercussions beyond the immediacy of 1918. So when you're going forward now to, say, 1935 or 36, when Churchill, who himself had put his butt, to say this uh, kind of crudely, but had put his, uh, his rear where his mouth was, Churchill himself had uh, served as First Lord of the Admiralty during the First World War, but had been sacked because of the disaster at Gallipoli on uh, the Bosporus, uh, around the Bosporus Straits in Turkey, or the Ottoman Empire. Uh, uh, Churchill signs up and goes uh, out to the front and fights. Uh, and almost gets killed in the process. He's not wounded, if my memory is correct, but Churchill saw combat, and he saw combat in the trenches. Churchill had seen it. He had seen the war. He was no chicken hawk, as it sometimes has been called. He's no, if a war hawk is somebody in favor of the war, but a chicken hawk is somebody's in favor of the war, uh, but you go, not me. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, but Churchill in the 1930s, Winston Churchill, the great man, Winston Churchill, the great statesman that's coming. So cometh the crisis, so cometh the man. Winston Churchill was in eclipse in the mid-1930s. In the early to mid-1930s, when Nazism was rising in Germany, Winston Churchill screamed aloud, and he screamed into the whirlwind 
listen up. They're coming. The Germans are rearming. Uh, they're doing it once more. They're gonna, there's gonna be a war. And people either poo-pooed it, ignored it, or tried to have Hitler, uh, excuse me, had Churchill sacked or run out of polite society. How dare you fan the flames of war, uh, Mr. Churchill? How dare you uh, bring up the omens of uh, conflict? We don't want war. There won't be a war. How do you know that? Well, it just won't happen. And for many Britons, uh, in elite circles and in less so, the idea of going back to war with Germany in the 1930s was as unpleasant and as, un, uh, as unappealing as a case of cancer. And to a degree, I understand that. I mean, uh, to, I can only speak now from 2020 Perch uh, in Snook, Texas, as I record this, thinking about looking back and saying, uh, yeah, that is that is unpleasant. I mean, I did not go through watching a generation of my friends uh, get hollowed out and killed. Because think of it this way, uh, some of the men who would have been in the trenches or junior officers in 1915 or 16, who might have been at the Somme by 1936 or 40, they would have been senior leaders or senior officers officers in the army or the, the members of parliament or in, in governmental circles in England. They didn't want to go back, and I understand that. But sometimes those things that in life that are very unpleasant have to be dealt with and adults have to deal with them. Uh, but the, cathar the uh, catharsis, the trauma, that's a better word, the trauma, of, the far better word actually, the trauma of the First World War cast a deadly pall over Britain and it enervated it and left them unable to respond to the growing German threat. And the longer you try to appease the Germans, and the longer you wait and try to do nothing and hope that it will go away, the greater and faster the German uh, rearmament takes place, the faster and larger the Wehrmacht grows, the faster and better uh, the uh, Luftwaffe, the Air Force of the German Army becomes, the German Air Force becomes, excuse me, uh, the longer you wait, the, the greater the peril is there. And so by the time the, the clock proverbially strikes midnight, it is, uh, in a sense, too late to avoid the awful conflagration. When had you done just a little bit in 1935 or 36, you could have avoided so much slaughter uh, and death. But they didn't. And France, uh, to go further still, I've talked a lot about Britain because uh, I am most familiar with that in a sense. I'm also familiar enough with France to know that if you look at the average height and uh, the weight of an, a Frenchman in 1940, when uh, France is going to get into big trouble and is going to fall, uh, the average height of the average French man, man in 1940 is shorter and lighter than 1914. And the reason I make that comparison again is to give you an underscore with bright big letters, uh, the bright big marker. Is, is that the First World War just literally in a physical sense, let alone an emotional, cultural sense, uh, it just gutted the uh, French. The best and the brightest, the young lions of France, lay dead on the field of first, the First World War, and those who were left behind were uh, by far less of quality. With few exceptions, of course, but for the most part, France was a defeated nation before she even got on the battlefield in 1940. And that's not to say, by the way, that France has a small army. And you need to make note of that, too, is that in Europe in 1940, after the war has begun, and I'll get to the beginning of the war uh, formally in a second, the thing is is that France has, uh, outside of the Russians, uh, France has one, of, has one of the most capable and large armies, in fact, lar far larger than the German army, more armaments and so forth than the German army, uh, in 1940. But it's not, as Napoleon once said, it is to the physical to the moral as three is to one. But it was Napoleon, the great French emperor, said it like this, the moral is to the physical as three is to one. But the French were defeated. And the last group I, I mentioned offhand a few minutes ago when I started into this monologue about the failures of, uh, of Europe to stop the awful war, uh, early on to smother the Nazis uh, and to, uh, to destroy them while they were still weak and, hel uh, and uh, impotent uh, was the Russians, or the Soviets to say better. As you well know, after having watched uh, or heard me lecture on uh, the Soviets, you know they are a wicked and evil, and again, moral terms, I understand that, but they are uh, clearly a wicked and evil uh, uh, political organization, a country, and so forth. If we can apply wicked and evil to the Nazis, we can apply it to the communists because they killed as much, as, as many or more uh, of the Germans. They, of, excuse me, uh, 
the communists killed as many or more uh, as the Germans did or the Nazis did. They do it for their own reasons. They do it for different reasons, but they're not good reasons. I, the, so all that to say is, is that the... Uh, the leader of the Soviet Union is Joseph Stalin, who was a committed communist of the First Order. He, there's no doubt about that. You read of what he wrote, and you saw what he did, and you look into the archives later on, you find out that, oh yeah, Joseph Stalin, he was a believer. And what Joseph Stalin believed, frankly, was is that, uh, as kind of the articles of faith, and I use that, uh, again, explicitly religious terminology here for a, an explicitly atheistic uh, even movement in the case of the communist uh, as well uh, the fact was is that uh, there was an article of faith in soviet circles especially uh, held by uh, joseph stalin that uh, the west would tear itself apart and uh, frankly all we have to do is just move in after they collapse it was a to use a term it was a rotten structure and then they'll kill each other and then it'll be our our turn uh, they have the same, they meaning Stalin now, has the same preconceived notions about the Germans. Uh, and Stalin uh, is not opposed to making deals with the Germans to get what he wants in the long term. Because Stalin is going to try to play the long game. Uh, let the Germans fight it out with the, uh, with the English and the French. Uh, when they all fight each other to a, a standstill and, and knock each other to pieces, then it will be our turn to spread the communist uh, ideology. There will be people ready for Bolshevism. They'll be ready for the common turn, and then we can spread our armies, in this case the Red Army or the NKVD, the Secret Service, will spread out, and we'll have our moment as well. And so the Soviet Union, uh, which was uh, so, uh, ideologically uh, Stalin in the Soviet Union, because it's uh, synonymous terms because Stalin runs the show over there, was not interested in uh, doing anything to stop the Germans. He had his own uh, he had his own issues and his own ideas, and on top of that, he's also consolidating power within himself. It's in this same time period of the not mid to late 1930s that it's Stalin, as I've mentioned before to you, who is purging the, the kulaks of uh, the Ukraine. He's going to purge the army. He's going to purge the party. Uh, he's got his hands full with blood uh, flowing in the, in the rank and file of of the party and elsewhere in the Soviet Union. So Stalin, he's uh, keeping hands off and he's kind of isolated. So uh, as uh, we get closer and closer to war, uh, the fact was is this, that uh, Hitler was uh, wanting war. He was yearning for war. He was wanting to prove it. Uh, and the uh, army, in a sense, in the, uh, the Wehrmacht leadership had been trying to tap the brakes on on Hitler and trying to get him to avoid war, that we're not ready, rearmament is not complete, wait till 1940, wait till 1941, give us more time. And uh, arguably, had Hitler been more patient, he might have been able to, uh, you know, get more than he did. But he wasn't. Hitler was impatient, and Hitler wanted to go to war, and he forces the issue with Poland in 1939. Because in 1939, uh, one of the things that the, the British and the French had agreed to was a mutual defense pact with Poland. That if Poland had been, it was uh, to be invaded by the Germans, then Britain and France would go to war against Germany to defend Poland. Uh, it wasn't an empty threat by this point in time. It was a real threat. Uh, the, Ger the British and the French had finally run to the end of their patience with G uh, Germany, uh, and yet there were still, by the way, uh, those in Britain who were still talking about appeasing uh, the, uh, the Germans. Give them Poland. Let them have it. We need to stay out of war. Uh, but by s August of 1939, it was becoming more and more clear that the English or the British people, uh, to a lesser degree the French people, were just not going to roll over one l more time for, uh, for Hitler uh, and his, and his uh, designs. Hitler half expected, it seems to be Hitler half expected them to, but he wasn't exactly upset when they didn't. Uh, and so the, the Germans who had forsworn the year before and said, we have no interest in Poland, are now uh, sending up smoke signals, big smoke signals, that they want the return of German territory that had been part of the Second Reich under the Kaiser. And so that is there. Uh, and in the meantime, while Hitler is preparing for war, Hitler has ordered his men, to, his uh, officers and his uh, staff to prepare for war, to mass the army, to get ready to march on Poland. Uh, 
the fact of the matter was is that Hitler had sent out sent out secretly uh, his uh, chief uh, foreign secretary, a guy named uh, Ribbentrop, uh, Joachim von Ribbentrop, who was a committed Nazi but also of the old Prussian elite. Ribbentrop uh, is going to take a uh, trip to Moscow, and it is there. Uh, Ribbentrop is going to deal with Stalin and, and uh, uh, oh gosh, V, not V, I uh, V O Molotov, M O L O T O V, who is, uh, was Stalin's foreign secretary. The uh, Ribbentrop and Molotov and Stalin are going to meet and uh, negotiate. And it's one of the, uh, and going to partition Poland. It's called the Non-Aggression Pact, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. It's signed on 20, the 23rd of August of 1939, essentially a week out from the war. Stalin uh, uh, agrees to it. Uh, Molotov signs the documents. Uh, Hitler, of course, agrees to it from the German perspective. Ribbentrop signs the documents. And what the document says is, is that in the advent of war, Germany and the Soviet Union would partition Poland and cut it and cleave it about like you would with a uh, with a uh, axe or what have you. The western part of Poland would go to the be absorbed by Germany. Uh, the eastern part of Poland would be absorbed by the Soviet Union, and Poland would be no more. Now understand this, when that uh, non-aggression pact was announced, uh, jaws dropped through all out, uh, throughout Europe. Because one of the things that the uh, Nazis had made their, their hay on early on, I mean, this is before they were a threat. This is before they got elected. But it was one of the things that the Nazis hated, and I mean hate, I don't mean that as a throwaway word here. And I make this point to you in that lecture about uh, who, did, who went to the, uh, the, the uh, concentration camps first. Uh, did the Nazis hate the Jews? Of course they did. We know it's called the Holocaust. But in, a, in many respects, the first groups of people to go to the concentration camps in 1933 and whom the Nazis hated before 1933 when they took power were the communists. They hated them to the point they'd fight them in the streets and they hated them to the point they'd put them in jail and kill them. And so... And to be clear, Stalin had no love for the Nazis. Uh, there was enough uh, propaganda belched out by the communist movement that would essentially say that the Nazis were uh, uh, just the tools of the capitalists. All this to say is, is that it shocked many observers. Uh, some naive uh, communist who uh, always believed the Soviet line in Pravda, which, by the way, the word Pravda, which is the Soviet official newspaper, means truth. Uh, people joked it meant that you meant, had to believe the opposite if you wanted to understand what was true. But Pravda, they believed all the Soviet lines. And so that when uh, Stalin makes a deal the, uh, to partition Poland, for some who were fellow travelers with the Soviets, for some who were uh, believing communists in the United States or Britain or elsewhere, France, for example, that was the breaking point. And they, uh, they may have been communists, but they backed away from Stalin. Others... They switched just like a wet wind uh, or weather vane in the wind, and they turned and did whatever Stalin asked. And in fact, actually, you will see this uh, in France in 1940 uh, during the war. Uh, uh, Stalin had sent out uh, feelers and word through his uh, spy agencies. The Soviets were famous spy masters. Uh, and sent the word through the labor unions that were heavily infiltrated by the communists that they were just, they were supposed to do everything they could to help bring down the French war effort. And so there's a whole lot of uh, back and forth shenanigans. And uh, if I say shenanigans, it sounds like it's just kind of like a, uh, you know smoking and joking and messing around. It's not. It's far far more uh, sinister than that. But all I'm saying is is that uh, there was uh, acts of espionage and uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, the idea of of uh, blackmail, uh, explode. Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. But basically, they, the communist labor boys in France in 1939, especially 1940, are doing their level best to uh, sabotage. That's the word. Sabotage the French war effort far more so than in England. Anyways. Uh, and then on September 1st, 1939, the uh, Soviets, excuse me, the Germans announced uh, that they are returning fire, uh, that uh, the uh, Polish had invaded Germany, and that, they were t t that the uh, invasion of Poland in response had begun, and Poland is going to be overrun and overrun in the matter of, uh, of about a six-week period, maybe two months.
Uh, famously out of that, out of that, uh, War, uh, famously out of that event, uh, you see uh, the Polish cavalry making charges against uh, German armor, uh, What you find out later on that that was mostly just uh, German propaganda, but it is stuck uh, to this day. People think that the Polish cavalry uh, charged uh, the German uh, tanks, and that was, uh, uh, that was Joseph Goebbels' handiwork. The Polish, to their credit, fought as hard as they could, uh, but they are, they are between a hammer and an anvil. Uh, they are between two far superior powers. Uh, the British are, would love, perhaps, to help them, but there's not much they can do other than offer moral support. Uh, the French uh, cannot uh, come to the aid of the Polish, and Poland is uh, going to be swallowed up by both the Soviets and the German Nazis. Uh, and in fact, actually, what you find there is is that uh, some of the, the this is where you really get the beginnings. I would argue of the uh, the Holocaust as we understand it. Not to say that there wasn't uh, oppression of Jews in Germany prior to World War II. They almost began, but there, the thing is, is there just wasn't that many Jews in large numbers in Germany prior to World War II. Uh, memory serves, I'd have to look, I think it's about 150,000 or so, but I'd have to check that number. Point is this, uh, prior to World War II, you often found the German government willing, uh, the Nazi government, I should say, same difference, uh, to allow Germans to immigrate away from Germany. That was the idea, get them out of here. That was, that was their handling of it prior to the war. But what we understand is now the uh, Holocaust and the great killing of Jews and gypsies and other non undesirable elements, Leben sind Verdes Leben, life unworthy of life, including uh, handicapped and those who were uh, mentally, uh, uh, who had no, um, or had, a, had learning disabilities uh, and so forth, uh, Down syndrome uh, and, and what, what have you, uh, they were killed as well. Uh, but the real ire of the Germans was directed toward the Jews and the Gypsies uh, in horrible numbers, of course, uh, culminating what's known as the Von Sea Conference and the Final Solution, which means gassings uh, and so on, as we understand with Auschwitz. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that that really took off because of what the Germans and also the Soviets, but the Germans found in Poland. It was is that there is uh, a large, large population, a native population of uh, Polish Jews, uh, and what do you do with them? And so the answer starts to come back. Initially, was shoot them, uh, but that was untenable of a solution. It was uh, wasteful, and a lot of German soldiers were really not interested in just shooting civilians left and right. And so there you get uh, the Bonsi Conference uh, in outside of Berlin, 1941, I believe it was, uh, and then eventually it uh, morphs into the Auschwitz camps, du uh, Buchenwald, Dachau, as we understand it, with the gas chambers. Uh, but you see that as the Germans are going to go westward, or excuse me, go eastward, they find so many uh, Jews, uh, and, and their, their goal is to kill them and eradicate it. The answer to the, to the Jewish question. Uh, the, but that's uh, getting a little bit ahead of the game. Uh, the, the Germans are going to be noted for their invasion of Poland in 1939, and one of the things they uh, introduce is a new form of, or a new type of warfare, uh, mechanized warfare, uh, blitzkrieg, as uh, many of you know, the lightning warfare, as it's uh, sometimes called. But what made uh, Blitzkrieg work wasn't just that there was uh, tanks involved. That's certainly true. The German armor, were, German armor was good at that point in time, not outstanding. Uh, they will get better is in the war before the bombings start to take a hold of uh, German industry and slow it down. But... Uh, the German tanks and armor was good. Uh, the German Luftwaffe, the a German Air Force, was good and certainly superior to the Polish Air Force. Uh, and certainly, if nothing else, in raw numbers. <laughs> Excuse me. I apologize for that. Uh, ate a little too much food this morning, I guess, for breakfast. All that to say, though, is, is that seemingly, though, what really makes ger the German Blitzkrieg run and go at high rates of speed is communications. Uh, compared to the French who were still uh, traveling and trying to communicate by telephone, uh, and if that broke down, meaning the wire was cut, you'd have runners and uh, basically couriers, the Germans were moving past that. Uh, their goal was to have radio communications. Uh, their communications were far superior and it allowed for a greater, uh, the greater ability to move troops and, and uh, reposition armored units and so forth as needs warranted. And so the initial practice of Blitzkrieg uh, 
which actually was born in some very small ways in the First World War, is going to be trotted out and tried in the Second World War in Poland. So, war is at hand. And in 1939, uh, after Poland falls, you have this kind of period of time, this lull, in which you think uh, nothing's happening. They called it the phony war, the fake war, uh, the non-war perhaps even. But the fact was is that uh, the Germans, after having absorbed the, uh, the Polish, having absorbed Poland, uh, they're going to start to go to war in Scandinavia and take that. Uh, in addition to that, however, the real story for us in this sense, this is not a full-on uh, detailed set of lectures on the world war in Europe. Uh, we must turn now to France. And in, from May 10th through the 25th of June 1940, France goes under the hammer. So what do you do? Do you fight uh, the war? In, if you're France, how do you fight this war? You've obviously called up your uh, reserves. You've uh, gone to a war footing. Uh, but the uh, German, or rather the French army is very brittle. It's very fragile. Uh, the German army uh, had, excuse me, the French army had established uh, a various outpost. Uh, was, would the uh, Germans try to pass through the Low Countries once more like they did world, in World War I? No. Uh, would they go through, would they try to pass through um, the, uh, the fortifications there on the common uh, German border? The answer was maybe. How do the Germans invade France? How do we go about this? Uh, and the answer for the Germans was to attack and in invade into France through the Ardennes Forest. Uh, what was really a masterful stroke of organization, planning, uh, practice, uh, just preparation, the Germans were able to mar uh, march and move an army through the Black Forest, excuse me, the Ardennes Forest, uh, in 1940, and when they pass through it, they catch the, uh, the French completely by surprise, bypassing fortifications left and right, and just the, the French army is shattered. Uh, it was brittle, it was fragile, it couldn't take any hammer blows, the surprise was so great, uh, the, Brit the French leadership, uh, meaning the leadership of the nation, let alone the, the army, was uh, haphazard and poor. Uh, and in the span of effectively six to eight weeks, uh, you could say really about seven weeks, the fact of the matter was uh, on the 25th of June 1940, the German army marched through Paris. Uh, very famously, lots of photographs out there on the Internet. You can see them without any real issue. Uh, it is fair to say that um, with France, that when, Fra uh, when Paris falls, France falls with it. France surrenders in the north half or the north third uh, going back toward Germany is going to be part of uh, a German protectorate state. And then you have Vichy France, which is named after the capital of the rump state of Vichy, uh, is going to be allied with Germany. And so Germany, in a sense, is pulled off in the span of about a year. Uh, and in fact, actually looking at my notes here, realistically, it's about uh, about nine months. It has pulled off in nine months what the, the, the Kaiser's Germany could not do in four years. Hitler has conquered a large swath of Europe, and the conquering will go on. And in fact, actually, it's worth noting, too, is as much ballyhooed as the uh, French resistance was, and there was some resistance by Frenchmen to German occupation. The reality seems to be, actually, it's not just seems to be, it is statistically provable uh, and anecdotally uh, sound that, the, uh, that France was a very good uh, place for Germans in occupation. Uh, in fact, actually, many Frenchmen are going to join the German army uh, as uh, allies. Uh, there was many Frenchmen who had kind of uh, become demoralized to the point they would get with the winner, whoever the winner was. And in fact, actually, more Frenchmen uh, join or collaborate with the Germans than did uh, join or collaborate with the resistance under Charles de Gaulle. Going further still, uh, it is fair to say that I, I have read and have seen elsewhere where German soldiers and officers commenting on uh, occupation duty said it was the, 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 the most wonderful thing to be in Paris because the people were so nice and they didn't hate you. Uh, so you've got to be a little careful when you talk about the French and uh, the resistance, uh, especially in the early to mid parts of the war, the occupation. Uh, there was no real, uh, it, it was very limited in resisting uh, the Germans. 
And, of course, later on when the war is over, toward the end of the war when Paris is liberated and elsewhere, uh, you'll see Frenchmen who were saying all along, yeah, I was with you, I was fighting the resistance. Um, that's kind of the way people do. They always get with a winner, it seems like. So all that to say is, is that France has fallen, and now Britain is alone. And Britain in 1940 is going to turn to uh, the man of the hour. I used the expression a minute ago, so cometh the crisis, so cometh the man. And in 1940, the man of the hour is Winston Churchill. Winston Spencer, Spencer Churchill. Winston Churchill is a complicated character. He comes from a elite stock. His father was a prime minister for a brief period of time in the 19th century, but he and his father never got along. In fact, arguably, they hated each other, uh, or at least uh, his father didn't look uh, kindly upon Winston. Always sent him off to boarding schools. In addition to that, Winston's mother was a, a serial philanderer, and she was quite the socialite, and uh, in this, the Churchills oftentimes didn't have much money, but yet they lived a very high lifestyle. Winston Churchill was one of the great uh, writers of the English language. Uh, he's going to have a command of the English language that has only been uh, handled uh, in such fi fine and artistic ways as uh, perhaps uh, Shakespeare, uh, the authors of the King James Version, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Tom Paine, to co uh, come to mind. Uh, but he had a command of the English language. Winston Churchill, in addition to being a great writer and a great speaker and just having a, the ability to mix the cadences, uh, was himself a, a brilliant man, pugnacious, loved to fight. He was involved in uh, three wars uh, during his time. Uh, he was in the Boer War in around 1900. He fought, as I've already mentioned, in the trenches after his collapse and eclipse uh, uh, in government in 1917 in uh, France. Uh, and then, of course, he is the head of state during the, the vast majority of World War II for the British Empire. Uh, and in a sense, uh, it was Winston Churchill who could uh, communicate to his people. Winston Churchill who could communicate marshalling the English language to, comp uh, to, to, to demonstrate uh, resilience, to demonstrate uh, the fight and uh, verve, uh, and frankly to give hope and to, uh, to buck up Brits. Britons or Englishmen when there wasn't much hope to be had because in 1940 and 1941 those are the darkest days of the war because the United States is on the sidelines. Uh, we'll get to that in the next lecture. But Britain is alone. France has fallen. Germany has ascended. Germany has swept through uh, southeastern Europe. It's swept through Scandinavia. Uh, there's reverses here. It's reverses there. Uh, in maybe the, and they're try they the Germans are trying to sweep through North Africa. It looks like the Germans are erecting their own empire, and Britain is all alone. Where are the Soviets? Well, in 1941, they were about to be invaded. Uh, and the Soviets, uh, that's a different uh, story for just a few moments from now. But Winston Churchill uh, had wandered in the wilderness. And the fact was is that Winston Churchill, uh, maybe in a sense alone amongst the uh, leadership or opinionated class of British or English society in the 1930s, had seen what Hitler was early on. He had understood clearly what Hitler was, uh, it, that he was a wicked man hell-bent on war and desiring to unleash the omens of war and uh, the evil spirits that come with that. Uh, whereas others said uh, that Churchill was nothing more than a warmonger himself who longed for combat and battle. You can't listen to him. It was Churchill who was proved right all along. Uh, and it was Churchill who uh, is going to be the unifying figure throughout the whole war. Is he the only man in the government? No. Uh, but at the same time, he is the symbol of the nation. And to go back and borrow a line from a Frenchman named Napoleon, whom I've already used once, and it was used by others as well, that uh, they would rather face a nation, or it, I'm going to mix the, or change it up a little bit, but they would rather ma uh, face a nation of lions led by a donkey than a nation of land. Uh, led by a lion. He, Winston Churchill, was the last lion, in a sense, of England. He was a throwback to the glorious age of Victoria, Queen Victoria, the Victorian age, when the, the breast, as it were, the chest of a Briton popped out and he said, I'm proud. 
He had, he had not been infected with the defeatism of the First World War, and he communicated that pride. He communicated that uh, vigor, that courage, uh, that pluckishness, that British bulldog aspect uh, to his countrymen, and many of them rallied around and responded to it. Uh, and it was dark times. Uh, the, we think about Dunkirk as a victory, and in a sense it was. The evacuation of the British expeditionary forces, uh, France is collapsing. Uh, that was a victory. It's a, one of the great. Uh, it's a pretty good movie. I, when I saw it in movie theaters, it was loud. Uh, so I was uh, wish I had earplugs that day. But all this is to say that uh, the evacuation of Dunkirk is not a winning of the war. It's just an evacuation. Yet it was Churchill who is able to uh, help uh, convince the Britons that this is a war worth fighting. And, and it's fair to remember that even after in Poland, uh, Poland in nineteen forty. Excuse me, 1939. And in some respects, even after France in 1940, the collapse of France, there are elements in the British government, elements in British society, elite elements. We're not talking about fringe German sympathizers, but men in position who are arguing once more for appeasement, we can't win. And it is Churchill who says, we will fight on the fields, we will fight in the, on the, uh, the, in the air, we'll fight in the sea, and we'll fight basically in the cities, we'll fight, we will fight, and we will fight or die. Uh, he calls them to, he calls the English people, he calls the British people to fight to the last man. And he, he arguably saves Western civilization from the Hun. I'm sorry to use it that term, but he saves them from uh, the German and the Nazi uh, menace, which was a great and, of course, growing and metastasizing menace. But was it the British that uh, win the war? Our answer is arguably no. Who wins the war in the West? Who wins the war in Europe? Is it the United States? Uh, arguably, yes. But I think if you talk about manpower and the uh, the absorption and the destruction and the, just the wrecking of not just Nazism, not just the German Wehrmacht, but just essentially ripping the guts out of German militarism that goes back centuries. Think of the Kaiser in the First World War, Frederick the Great, other adventures by the Prussians or other feudal states. The Germans had had a long-time love affair, predating Nazism, had a long-time love affair, an unhealthy love affair with the sword. And uh, those who live by the sword, as you may recall, will also perish by the sword. And the fact was is that the Germans for centuries, to one degree or another, had had this unhealthy, uh, uh, I would call it unhealthy, and I don't have any qualms about saying it like that to you, but had this unhealthy love affair with a sword, i.e. warfare. And there is something to be said for being a generally peaceable people. The Germans are that now, but it took uh, the carnage of two world wars uh, for them to understand and learn that horrible lesson. And the one who will teach them that horrible lesson was himself a horrible and wicked man, and that's Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. The, I think the winning of World War II in, the, in Europe was done on, in two accounts. And I'll talk about the second account in the next lecture. But the, first, the, one, the sec, next lecture I'll say this is it was American material. Taking nothing away from your great grandfathers who, or my great grandfather who fought, my grandfather, excuse me, y'all's great grandfather who fought in World War II. It is worth saying though, is, is that the vast majority, 90% of the men, 90% of the armaments roughly of the German, uh, Wehrmacht were thrown at and sent into the Soviet Union. And it was the Soviet Red Army who suffered millions of casualties themselves. Some of them self-inflicted, some of them not, uh, or some of them German-inflicted. All that to say is it was the Soviet Red Army that is going to rip the guts out of the Wehrmacht and destroy them and render them essentially broken as a fighting force. Uh, they were done. And when the World War was over in 1945, uh, there was no German outside of the most uh, hard-shell, hard-case Nazi who somehow tries to survive. Uh, who are German, a uh, proud German who thought we won this war, or we did not lose this war, to say it better. No one thought that in 1945. Uh, and it was Hitler who, back to where we were uh, just a few minutes ago, it was Hitler who is going to unleash the, 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 the Battle of Britain on the heirs of Britain, who's going to try to break Britain and then fails uh, spectacularly in uh, 1940, or July and October 1940, July through October. But Hitler's uh, interest wasn't uh, really with the British. He didn't hate the British 
uh, like he hated uh, the Soviets. He hated them. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, he looked upon the Soviet Union as a, quote, uh, uh, rotted structure, a rotten structure that all you had to do was to kick the door in and it would collapse in on itself. He, through his uh, spy agencies, through the German spy agencies, had a pretty good handle on what the, uh, the inter internals of the Soviet Union looked like, and they were not good. All those purges by Stalin in the 1930s, whether it was of uh, the peasant uh, farmer class, the kulaks in the Ukraine, or other farmers, uh, uh, landed farmers in the, so in the Russia part portion of the country, uh, whether it was the purge of the party, it was the purge of other uh, individuals in the army, half of the, let me think a second here, half of the officers in the Red Army were sent to Siberia or shot. In the other, uh, and in the senior officers, that would be like field marshals and general officers, general grade officers in the uh, Red Army. Something like 80% or 90% of them were, uh, prior to the World War, were sent to Siberia or shot. Uh, you're going to have these these purges and these uh, killings. And, in, and when I say killings, I'm not talking about tens of people or hundreds of people. I'm talking about thousands and millions uh, who are going to be starved to death, executed, or sent to Siberia, it takes an exacting toll upon the Soviet preparedness of 1941. So that when the uh, Germans invade the Soviet Union on uh, the 20, let me look at my note here, the, 20th, uh, the 22nd of June 1941, the Germans launch Operation Barbarossa, a millions of men, millions of Germans who are going to go flowing into and invade the Soviet Union. The Soviets weren't ready. There had been ample warnings from defectors, from spies, from signal intelligence and everywhere saying a massive invasion is coming, Comrade Stalin, get ready. But you had to say that, and you had to say that uh, politely, because if you gave information to Stalin that was uh, unwelcome, it's very possible, if not likely, that Lavrente Beria's uh, goon squad or some other uh, enforcement element is going to send you to Siberia or stand you on the wall and shoot you. Uh, so there were many officers who were, anyway, probably inferior not probably many were just simply inferior, bad officers at the outbreak of the war with, the, with uh, the German Nazis. In addition to that, they were not just inferior, but they were timid. Because if you stuck your neck out too far, well, your head gets cut off. Maybe literally. I mean, because the, if you read about the uh, tender mercies of the NKVD, as you well know, they weren't very tender. So uh, the fact was is that you had to be very, very careful uh, with the Soviets uh, and with uh, sending bad news back to Stalin. And curiously, curiously, Stalin wanted to believe that uh, he uh, not uh, that that he wanted to believe that the that Hitler would not invade him. He wanted of all the people he never trusted. He trusted Hitler uh, when Hitler was saying essentially, "I'm not going to invade you," and Hitler was preparing to do exactly that. Uh, it was a. Uh, it's interesting and in some ways befuddling to think for a man who was paranoid at times and certainly distrustful of most, if not almost all people around him, at times Stalin can be awfully, awfully naive when it comes to dealing with Hitler and believing what Hitler was up to or not. All this is to say, though, is, is that Stalin does not prepare the Red Army. He does not give any orders. No one is going to contradict him, as I just said, because of uh, fear of their life or their family's life even. And on and down the list we go. So when the Germans invade uh, the Soviet Union late in, in uh, June of 20, uh, 1941, because they were supposed to start the invasion basically in May, uh, but they were late by about a month, and that probably cost them the war right there. But anyways... Uh, when the, the Germans invade, the Soviets are going to be just uh, messed up. The Red Army is just getting racked, beat back, driven back. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the kill ratios between German to uh, Soviet troops in the first months of the war was astounding, hundreds to one, hundreds to one, hundreds to one. Uh, the Germans were just going through the Soviet Union like hot knives through butter. The Germans had three... Let me see if I can get three of my fingers up here. Had three main uh, battle groups, three main army groups. One was going to go to Leningrad, and uh, which is today St. Petersburg, and wall off that city and basically hold it hostage and then squeeze it out. And they will get there, and they will lay siege to that city. Uh, often forgotten, just because unless you're a, a real reader of the eastern front of the war, which most Americans aren't, 
And that was some horrible stuff that went on in Leningrad. For those who were uh, in, uh, more famously, and more Americans would know this next part, there's going to be a southern army group or southern battle group of the German Wehrmacht that's going to head ultimately to the city of Stalingrad, which, of course, is, the, I would say it like this for your notes, the turning point in the uh, war uh, with uh, uh, Germany. And then the center group that is going to be pointed straight toward Moscow gets to the outskirts of Moscow in the winter of 1941 uh, and as the cold descends upon the German army and essentially starts to freeze it in its tracks. It's there where I think I ref referenced in a previous lecture about communist uh, and, and Stalin's uh, uh, barbarity uh, and his uh, in his harshness. That it was there uh, that the Soviets needed uh, needed uh, trucks, and so they threw the wounded Soviet soldier out in the uh, out of the ambulance, and they commandeered ambulances to rush supplies to the front. The Americans never did that. The British never did that. The Germans even didn't do that, but the Soviets did. So uh, all this to say is is that uh, but. It takes uh, essentially a six-month period before the German onslaught is, is stalled out, and it's mostly stalled out because of the weather. But the Germans, uh, they miss their mark. The Germans start to, uh, start to show that they aren't uh, invincible. Uh, the weather slows them down. The, the Russians, uh, through an amazing and just simply hell-bent desire to move industry eastward and to get it away from the German army, they will rebuild their heavy industry for what it was worth in uh, and around the Ural Mountains. Get it east, get it east, get it east. And then in 19 and uh, 40, let me see if I got this, yeah, 19 and 43, uh, I think the turning point of the war be is, is found in Stalingrad. The Germans are going to uh, destroy what they thought was uh, the majority of the Red Army. In the war, the Germans went into the war thinking that the Red Army had the ability to, to field about 110 or 120 divisions, several million men. They killed that many, evidently, um, in the war, killed, wounded, missing. They were casually. So the Germans thought they'd done the job, but it seemed like the, the Russians had a never-ending supply of replacements. The Germans also can be... Uh, uh, Faulted for, one, obviously invading uh, Russia. I guess that's what the lesson of Napoleon was, don't invade Russia. But uh, it wasn't just that. The Germans also had an opportunity to turn the local population against the communists. The uh, Germans, uh, especially Nazi ideology, uh, had the uh, gospel effect uh, that the that Ger that Soviet Union was rotted and that all you had to do was kick the door in and it would collapse, and that the war would be over within the matter of months, uh, meaning six months perhaps, maybe a year. But it would not be a long war, and the vast majority of your casualties will be Soviet casualties, you, and this, remember, is going to be Lebensraum. This is going to be the, the living space for the new and greater Germany. What the Germans made the mistake of doing, I would argue, in addition, they made a lot of mistakes in, in losing this war uh, in and one of the things that the Germans did was is when they invaded the Ukraine, and I've talked offhand here in this uh, lecture, but it was true uh, in, in, uh, prior to the war, the Ukrainians felt the deep and hard boot of the Soviet Russians, that the Soviets are going to kill and slaughter and starve through man-made famines many, many, many people. Thousands, frankly millions, of kulaks and others are going to starve to death or be sent to Siberia uh, in concentration camps. Uh, you know, that's appropriate. They're gulag. It's a gulag archipelago. Uh, anyways, uh, many Ukrainians hated the Soviets. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's really nasty stuff. And that when the German tanks and the German trucks move through Ukrainian towns and villages during Barbarossa in its early days in 1940, as the Red Army is being hurled back toward its, uh, its no, uh, basically its last stand positions at Leningrad, Moscow, and Stalingrad for our purposes, uh, Ukrainians literally will start handing out bouquets of flowers, handing out breadstuffs to the Germans as they pass by. Thank you for liberating us. We're glad to see you. The thing is, is that uh, had the Germans played their cards better and not tried to almost immediately start to kill and to imprison or to remove the Ukrainians from their native land, they could have used them against the Soviet Russians. Uh, 
The Germans didn't because, well, we need the land, the war is going to be over quickly, and we, we think the Slavs, the Ukrainians, are just as worthless as uh, the Russians are. Get rid of them. Liquidate them. It was a strategic mistake of the First Order, but Hitler, who uh, was, uh, uh, was lucky and good in the early days of the war, uh, starts to make strategic error and blunder, humanitarian disaster and, and evil time after time after time, cost them the war. I think, however, that it was the Soviets and their absorption of the, the German Wehrmacht and then their crushing of the German Wehrmacht in World War II uh, that is going to win the war. Germany is hurled backwards. Uh, the Wehrmacht is sent flowing back toward Germany, and once the skids start going back, you have a tank battle at Kursk, and there's lots of other events that we're not going to get into. But the turning point in the eastern front in the war was at Stalingrad. In the meantime... In Germany, in, 19, uh, in the 1940s, uh, 1942, especially 1943 and 44 and 45, you're going to see German cities pummeled and pummeled and pummeled. Uh, and we'll talk more about that uh, as well. Uh, but Germany is going to get pounded from all sides. Uh, the, German, <clears throat> the German ally in Italy was a paper tiger. It was a very weak ally, not very good. Uh, and Germany is in great, great and dire straits. But probably if we talk about Germany and the World War, uh, one of its greatest mistakes, along with invading the Soviet Union, was uh, done in December of 1941, uh, about December 10th, 1941, when Hitler uh, declared war. And he, I mean, obviously, legally, there's machinations in there. But Hitler declares war on the United States after Pearl Harbor. Uh, bringing the United States to bear against uh, Germany uh, was, along with the Soviet Union, along with uh, the, what's left of the British Empire, those three uh, elements right there is sealed the doom for the Germans. In fact, uh, Churchill, um, he, I'm going to paraphrase it, I don't have the quote sitting in front of me, but basically per Churchill, after hearing uh, that the uh, the that Hitler had declared war in Germany and the United States Congress had uh, returned the favor in kind by declaring war in Germany in, in early or mid December 1941, uh, basically said, I slept the, uh, the sleep of the saved. And he knew we'd won the war. It's just a matter of when and a matter of how. But all that to say is, is that uh, this is where we set the table for Europe in the war and we get the United States in in the next lecture. Uh, out east, or rather, excuse me, out west from an American perspective, across the Pacific Ocean, you're going to see uh, uh, Japan. And Japan, from the mid-1930s all the way through to 1941, is going to be on uh, advancing, uh, uh, on conquest and advance of, uh, <laughs> I can't talk at this point, uh, but it's going to be advancing its uh, interest. It's going to invade China. I talked about that in the form of the rape of Nanking. They're going to invade Korea. They're going to invade the uh, Philippine archipelago. You will see the tentacles of the Japanese empire stretch almost all the way down to Australia. Of course, across the islands of the eastern, uh, the western Pacific, uh, the J Japanese empire is a far-flung empire, and it is extraordinarily uh, what well, is extraordinarily brutal to be in that uh, under their boot. The Japanese never have the same amount of industrial uh, know-how or technical know-how that the Germans do, but they are able to supply their men. They're able to supply their navy. The navy is actually pretty good. Uh, but the to be a non-Japanese underneath the boot of a... Japanese POW guard or Japanese soldier could be very bad for your health. Uh, famously so in the book and movie uh, Unbroken, uh, you'll see that about uh, Ernie Zamp uh, Zamperini, uh, who is going to basically be a POW uh, with the bird, amongst others. So there's many, many stories about American prisoners who's going to be hurt by the Japanese. But the Japanese, their empire in the Western Pacific is as impressive uh, as it would be, in a sense, of the German empire that was uh, briefly flowered there in the early 1940s in Europe. Uh, completely wicked in their own right. They will do uh, a lot of testing and things that uh, you already know, stomach-turning things. Uh, but this is really a clash of civilizations now, a clash of uh, uh, those who want some uh, semblance of humanity and those who, who do not. Um, so I, I skip over very quickly here when I talk about the Japanese. I'll deal with that uh, more a little bit in the next uh, lecture when it comes to the American uh, aspects. But anyways, that's a good place to stop. That sets us up uh, for uh, the entry of the United States into World War II.